Hey, everybody, everybody, it's your main man, Anthony Brogdon on the one and twos. I got a good looking lady on the channel today. She going to blow your mind with some black history. She nice people, too. You get a nice vibe from her. I know the people in her community say, whoa, that's a nice lady right there. And she's smart. And she know what she's talking about. She going to tell you something today that you probably don't know a lot of. And when you finish watching this video, you will know a lot of it. Watch. It's, this is going to be good. This is what we do with Strong Inspirations, where I give it to you straight, no chaser. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to intoxicate your mind, not me, my guest. Well, we're going to put a little lime, a little lemon, a little cherry, or whatever it takes, so that when you finish watching this, you are staggering with this good history. Not DUI staggering, but staggering with this history. So you say, dang. And here is where it all happens. So I want you to do these things, these things for me, my friends. First of all, my name is Anthony Brogdon. I got excited today. <laughs> Let me tell you that. Second of all, I want you to hit the subscribe button. It's free. It don't ask no information. It just tell me and let me know you like me because I like you already and ain't nothing you can do about it. I like you because I know you're watching. I get comments every now and then. And whoa, let me tell you something, my friends. Y'all know I'm in Detroit. I got a comment from a lady who's a complete stranger. I did not know her. And I was, I was, I don't even know where I was at. I'm hanging out, you know, summertime, what have you, what have you. And she says, uh, hey, uh, are you Anthony Brogdon? Because I watch you on Strong Inspirations. I said, what? She said, yeah. And I like your show. I thought that was pretty good. I know I'm moving in the right direction. So uh, hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button on this video. You're going to like it a lot. Hit the notifications bell for when the videos come up. Like, did you see the video I just put up with the lady? And let me tell you, this sister is out of Laurel, Mississippi. Sis Mississippi. She says that she has put together some protests where the white races showed up with their guns. I said, what? She said, yeah, they was on the trees. They was on the roof. They thought we were, going, we were there to take down the Confederate soldier. She said, we ain't here but in love. So one of the pastors uh, 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 put his gun, you know, because we ain't coming without ours too now. We ain't going to just let this lay down, so to speak, right? It ain't going to be good for us because they got everybody on their side, including the sheriff. But that's another story. She said, so the brother who's a minister, he put his gun down. He said, hey, man. And he walked over to one of them races and she said, shake my hand. And the guy had to. You that bad? You, I'm here in love in Christ. And let me tell you something. I, I, this just happened to me. And I, it's on my heart. That video made me cry. She made me cry. Watch that one. I just put it up out of Laurel Jones County, Mississippi. I, I come up with these. Did you see the one I did with the brother Shelly Stewart out of Birmingham, Alabama? He was the voice of the civil rights movement out of Birmingham because he was a radio DJ. He said he got the word what was going on or whatever they told him to let the people know secretly or whatever he would do it. Watch that video. Staying in this civil rights type thing. Did you see the one I did with the Bishop Calvin Brooks? I think that's the right name. <clears throat> he said, man, he'd been spit on, he'd been shot at, he'd been kicked, he'd been jailed. He said, but God kept him straight. He said, but the one night that they came to his house with them torches and them robes and them hats, and kicked in his door at, 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 at four o'clock in the morning, that scared him. He said he got down on his knees, his wife and everybody else, and they left. Watch that video. They, we got them all over. We got them from across the globe too. We got them out of Africa and Australia and all that other, uh, uh, a part of this country. Oh, how about this? I don't say this much. 
but I'm gonna say it a little bit more. You can watch Strong Inspirations for free. So if you if it's in your heart, send us a love donation. Uh, just just in case, you know. I mean, help 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 me. You know, I I don't, I don't have no problem with it. What Jesse said, Jesse Jackson said, "Don't make me beg. <laughs> don't make me beg." So send the donations. Go to my website, businessintheblack.net. Uh, I'm jamming here. And this lady, y'all gonna like her. Watch. Now y'all know that I'm a filmmaker. This is how serious I am about my game. I did this documentary that took me three years out of my life to produce for you, my friends, where it talks about slaves who went to college and slaves who own businesses and black folks who were rich back in the day. Stuff that you, names I know you don't know. It's called Business in the Black. It's streaming on Amazon. Go ahead and watch this. You will not fall asleep on my film. No way. And then I took it one step further and I wrote this book. It's called Black Business Book. Got to get you a copy of this. And I, how about this? It is the number one black history book on the market. There is no other book as thorough as mine. And not just because I wrote it. I've had other people tell me that because I list, how about this, 20 or more businesses that were owned by slaves. I tell you the name and what they did and that they bought their freedom. There are people in here I know you don't know. I'm not going to name no names now, but it's in my book. I promise you, it's very good. You can learn all about what I'm doing and that donation thing and so on and so forth on my website, businessintheblack.net. Check me out. I'm jamming. Somebody's saying something, and I can feel it. I can feel that vibe. And when y'all watch this lady right here, you're going to feel it too. So uh, you know my key word is the word strong. I love the word strong. I've been saying strong a long time, and I'm going to say strong until I die, probably. It can be on my tombstone. In my world, strong stands for strength. Tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to my guest today. She's a strong soul, sister. Come on and introduce yourself. Thank you for being on Strong Inspirations. Hi, how are you? My goodness, how do we follow up with that? Oh, you got that it. Was fantastic. Come on. Yes. So here's what I think I'm going to do for you. Um, you know, we have some pretty good social media with the Wegoja Foundation. Um, well, I'll introduce myself, I'm Dawn Dawson House. I'm executive director with the Wegoja Foundation in South Carolina. And what we do is advocate for the preservation, the identification, the documentation, and the preservation of African-American historic sites around the state. And we also try to raise awareness about this compelling story. Because when you look at all of our historic sites together, the story is so interesting that we put it on platforms for people to discover. And we'll talk about those platforms too. You probably heard of the Green Book of South Carolina.com online. And we just produced a book called The Green Book of South Carolina Travel Guide. So um, it trap, yeah, you use it, you travel with it. Um, Okay, yeah, hold, on, hold, on, hold on. I don't mean no disrespect in this regard, but I got to <laughs> stop you there. We're we going to get in all that. I, I, yeah. we we plugging on this channel. This is the plugging <laughs> channel right here. So don't okay, worry about okay. that. But I got to right. ask a couple questions about you personally. Okay. Because I want my guests to get to know, you know, my people to get to know my guests. And at that okay. regard, I, where are you from? Oh, gosh, long story. Military family. Parents are from Baltimore, Maryland. But yeah. um, we ended up in Beaufort, South Carolina at Paris Island, Marin core base. And so I consider myself from South Carolina. Uh, I married here. I went to school here, elementary, middle, high school, and college here. All of my friends are here. You know, my sisters live here with me. So yeah. Okay. So okay. I'm South Carolina. Columbia, well, where, South Carolina. Where, where, is the, where is the plantation at in your family? Do you know that? That I don't know. Now on my father's side, there was there, we, we married into what we think is the Drayton family. And we think the Drayton family on my father's side that his sister married into is part of the Drayton plantation, uh, mega plantation in Charleston, South Carolina. But my, my mother's side of the family um, is from Augusta. So we're not sure which plantations the LaFavors were uh, associated with. And my husband's family 
His last name is House. They were owned by um, a German with the last name of Haas, H-A-U-S. So their plantation was in Eastover, South Carolina. So we haven't done the due diligence getting into yeah, the sure. weeds. Um, but um, yeah, so we it's it's all over, just like for almost every African American in South Carolina. Yeah. You can trace your ancestry back to the South. And there are plantations on the South you can probably trace your ancestry to, but South Carolina was in was a port for that for um, the transatlantic slave trade. So you can probably take trace it all the way back to South Carolina, to oh, Charleston. Okay, I love it. Let me ask you this. Now, where you grew up, uh, is a black town, uh, most predominantly black, that kind of thing? It's Beaufort, Beaufort South Carolina, um, where the Gullah Geechee people are prominent, especially on the islands of Beaufort. Um, so in the black community in Beaufort, you could not you could not grow up without a significant appreciation for history. Uh, the, the, the adults that I grew up under made sure we knew what Tulsa was, made sure we understood what reconstruction was and Robert Smalls, made sure we knew that the enslaved Africans on the coast of South Carolina were freed seven months after the Civil War started. So in 1862, these right. Africans were freed. They were emancipated. And the test that the Union forces used to develop Reconstruction began in Beaufort, where, where I grew up at, at this, at this area called the Port Royal area. And it was called the Port Royal Experiment. And it was um, the nation's noble attempt to bring enslaved Africans into American citizenship. Mm -hmm. making sure they were educated, knew how to pay bills, knew how to work land and own land. They already knew how to work the land, yeah. um, knew how to pay their taxes, could read and write, all those things that, and knew how to vote and knew the importance of voting. All those things that they believed were benefits of citizenship, they tried to deliver to African-Americans and they tested it in the Port Royal Experiment in Beaufort. I love so it. that it, history is profound in Beaufort. We were not allowed to grow up without knowing that. When you say that, you weren't allowed. Did they teach that in school? Or no, did, no. Mm -mm. Well, how we did you get it? it? Yeah, how did churches, you get it? Churches and get-togethers and the NAACP meetings. And um, whenever somebody had, uh, gosh, every social event we had, the, the pastor would mention Port Royal Experiment and Reconstruction and Robert Smalls. We knew all about that. Okay. Sunday schools even talked about it. We, we, okay. we you know, we, that it. Was, it was it was in our fabric. It was in the fabric of everyday life. I love and it. You, mm -hmm. what, what about this one? Did, 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 where were the white kids and where were the black kids in your town? Okay, so we uh, we started going to school in the um, in Buford in the seventies. So we were just integrating. You know, um, South Carolina was one of those latent states that tried to um, resist integration throughout the nineteen sixties. After Brown passed in 54, 1954, South Carolina built Reconstruction. Uh, no, what do you call it? Um, uh, the schools that they said were. Uh, were equalization schools. They tried to build equalization schools to keep the blacks and the whites separate. So we had this long history of being separate. So when they forced us together in the seventies, it was tense. It was fights, it was yeah. battles. But there were also attempts to, to unite and understand each other. At least that was the way it was through sport yeah. and band and extracurricular activities. Okay. So I never, I never grew up in a segregated school system. Yeah. Now the the history that was taught to me was definitely whitewashed. I but bet you. Our parents made sure that we understood tr as much true history as they can get their hands on. Okay, let me ask you this. Uh, I don't mean no disrespect. Did did you ever have you ever been called a nigger down there? I haven't, but I have seen other people be called that in really? certain contentious and oh my gosh yes come on in certain in certain contentious situations at school and in, in at the pool at the public pool swimming pool at the beach um okay at, think, I, I, I like this because i want people to be we real here can you remember what like one of those stories 
like at the pool or the beach you just mentioned? What okay, might have happened? So, okay, so, um, oh boy, uh, maybe I should. There was a young lady who was dating a black guy and they She's got white. into an argument. She was white. And they got into an argument and he was like, you know, he called her a, you know, a witch, but with the B. Okay. He said, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. You, you got to go. So she called him the N-word. the N-word and ran. And then she ran to brothers, her, her own brothers or cousins or friends who were also white. So I remember that. And I remember my parents saying, come on, let's get away. Come on, let's go. Let's go. So I don't remember seeing all of it. Yeah. But I remember that first contentious part. Yeah. Okay. How about this one? Did Did you think white people were better than black people growing up? I grew up, and when I was in elementary school, um, I was in, on a military basis. Um, I believed that I did believe when I was a kid that uh, dark skin black people were not as good as light skin black people. Whoa! There you go. And my parents there were you go. furious furious with me over that you said that to him i said something like i was maybe six or seven years old and i said something like oh no that person on tv who i was looking at on some kind of tv show oh no that person on tv is not as smart as that person over there and my parents just i was on punishment i was on punishment for a good while a good while because my parents said I was not going to be influenced more by um, the media and the stuff outside of the home than uh, than them. But We're but not but, let but, that but growing up down there, you knew that dynamic, though. I did, I did, I did, I did. did and did. but I was I was influenced by my classmates. My but and you know what the funny thing about it was. I never considered myself lesser than, lesser than my white counterparts. Or even or your lighter complected counter, like your lighter Correct. complected dark people. Correct. I never considered myself personally lesser than any of, any of them. In fact, most of the dark skinned people I knew were brilliant. These were the ones who were valedictorians, um, salutatorians. They were the ones getting A's and B's and a excel, a excellent work on chemist, in chemistry, in science, in biology, in history. I was struggling to be like them. Because but that I was allowed, that, brown, that, was that um, brown paper bag scenario that yeah, people did. Yeah, stuff and, like I, and, I, and I learned about brown paper bag when I was in college. And I did not know that it was a, a real thing. I learned about the dolls. What's it called? The, um, the, the dolls test that they taught elementary that they showed elementary skid elementary um, school kids uh -huh. to see what they thought about you know a, a white doll and then increasingly darker dolls and how the elementary skid elementary school kids would always say the lighter dolls were the better dolls yeah. i was one of those people who fell into that i was fortunate enough to have parents who would not let me stay there um, and, and that's the brainwashing that goes down, even within our race. Correct. Did, did, uh, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. Did, your grandfather, where was he from? And did he get an education? My uh, mother's father was from Augusta, Georgia, before he moved to Baltimore, Maryland. And he um, did not, he, he got a, a high school education, I believe, but he ended up being a uh, a factory worker at a meat packing plant in Baltimore. So his family always had meat, but they were from Augusta, Georgia. My mother was yeah. born in Augusta, in fact. My father's father was a postal man. Uh, talk about Brown Society. He was, he could pass if he wanted to. Pass he for. and a white person. Oh, really? So, so could my, my grandmother. Yes, they could pass if they wanted to. Um, um, but they didn't. And because their hair is quite kinky. <laughs> I got you, yeah, yeah. So, so, so my father despised that aspect of his family that some you know, could pass if they wanted to or thought they were better than others because they were lighter skinned. My father despised that. And he was not gonna let his children um, uh, you know, accept that kind of uh, 
personal reflection. He's like, you know, you were African American. You were black at the time. You called us black. Yeah. You were black. You yeah. are black, and you're going to respect black because yeah, I love the, it. the forces out here are not respecting you. And the only way you can survive is to respect all of you, and all of you is black. And that's what love my it. Is. Now, well, a couple more on that note. Did did you um? So you oh, let's go back over here on this other angle of the black and white thing. When you saw white people, what did that do for you? I mean, did, I mean, again, you know, growing up under that, you thought they were better, or could you wish that you were white? Because I, I think I remember saying that once. I yeah. remember saying that because I, I thought about it maybe one time. You know, what I mean, somewhere when I was a young kid, I thought being white might be better. You know, I never wished I was white because I always thought that I was on the same plane as them. I thought I was on the same level as them. I never thought really? I was okay, less than I them. Really? Okay, I love it. But, but I did think that if I wanted to, at one point, even through college, I thought that if I wanted to excel, I would have to count on white people to get there. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, I, I if I wanted to go that. somewhere, I would have to learn from them, follow them, you know, model them to get somewhere. That's what I used to think. And yeah. part of that is because I was not exposed to, I should have gone to an HBCU and I did not. Yeah. Part of it was that I was not exposed to uh, the level of Black, the volume of Black excellence that I think I needed. I love it. I love it. And there is, and and of course, as I went through my my career after college, I started getting into the workplace and I started discovering black excellence beyond I what it. I was taught in college. I love it. So when I saw I that it. black excellence, I'm like, this is who I am. I love it. I'm not this girl carrying Kate Spade purses. I am this woman with braids in her hair. I love it. And with that and carrying that, that's who I am. Yes. Hair. yes. So so you know yes. that's so yes. I had to I had to I had a come to Jesus moment. I had to, you know, realize who I was. Yes. And that happens when you're exposed to yes. black excellence. And there's so much of it everywhere. Everywhere. That goes un, unappreciated, un, you know, there's no, there's not, it's thankless, it's expected, yes. it's, you know, it's all yes. that. And uh, it, it, in your town, what, what was the black side of the neighborhood? What was the white side of the neighborhood? What's the names? Um, downtown Beaufort from Duke Street to Charles and King Street were mostly black. Um, I lived in what we call the country, uh, Burton. So I did not live, Mossy Oaks was considered white. Um, Burton proper was considered black. Neighborhoods around the air station were considered white. Um, did they tell you so, don't go over there to the white neighborhood and that kind of thing? No, no, uh, we oh, didn't yeah, have that yeah. kind of contention. They, yeah, they we didn't, didn't have, have that. that. And if and if there was some of that, I I was not exposed to it. There yeah. might have been, but I wasn't yeah. exposed to it. Well, is, is there um in the main strip where the black people lived? That what that what was the name of that street and where the Duke, black businesses were and that kind of thing? Well, yeah, Duke, Duke, and Charles and King Streets and um. Yeah, I think, yeah. And and the island, of course, St. Helena Island, Ladies Island, all yeah. of that. That's where the Gullahs were. That's where the Gullah people were. Did, did you play with Gullah people? Oh, my gosh, yes. I learned more from them than anybody else. Oh, really? They were, I couldn't understand. When I was eight years old, I couldn't understand what they were saying. But they were they're just outstanding, God-fearing um, people who, who want what's best for you and what's best for them. And they had a level of confidence that I had wished I had when I was that when oh, I was really? young. I love it. Mm -hmm. well, they, is were, there... they... Go ahead. Go ahead. They were very proud of themselves. They know they survived all kinds of odds, and they they had no they had no question about who they were, where they were going, where they came from, and and how important they are to the entire world. They knew God put them here, and they had no problem loving themselves. And I had wished I had had that kind of confidence when I was that age, when, from the time you, I was eight to the time I was 18. Well, when you talk about the, you said it like this, you said the Gullah people, you, <laughs> you know, you there's, there's the Gullah people and the non-Gullah people, let's say. Yeah. Wait, did, what, what, were they your friends? Could you, could you hang out with them and you went to school with them and, 
And you just knew they had, because of their dialect, a little bit of difference in their culture. That might that's correct. Been. That's okay. that's all it was. That's all it was. Right. Yeah. We were friends. We're still friends. Yeah. yeah. We're still friends. Uh, I went to my, my parents to live in Beaufort. They helped. They helped coordinate the Gullah Festival of South Carolina every wow. Memorial Day weekend. They don't do it anymore because they're in their 80s now. Yeah. But, um, when, you know, from the from 1985 until maybe 2000. 15, yeah, they were heavily involved in the Gullah Festival. And um, they, uh, yeah, so th it. these people are ours. Now, now, uh, Gullah people have, you know, Benyas and Kamyas, you know what those are, right? If you're no. a native, you're a Benya. You've been here, you've been here all, all your life. You're native, you're Benya. But if you are, if you move to Beaufort and you're black, you're a Kamya. So I've always been considered a Kamya. <laughs> Although I've been associated with Buford for more than 50 years, I'm still a Kumya. Um, but some of my, you know, longest friends, some of my people I've shared my deepest, darkest secrets with are Gullah. And uh, I can trust them and they're good people. And I love you know, it. Everything, everything's beautiful about them. So, so all this led you to love Black history like you do I and to want to do what you do today. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my, my, my career is strange. It took a trajectory that was, you know, different. I started out in radio um, and then I moved to newspaper. I was a newspaper reporter for about two and a half years. And then I got into public relations for tourism, which at the time when I got into public relations for tourism in 1989, tourism was still growing in South Carolina and a lot of tourism in South Carolina was building off of the Gullah culture and building off of history and heritage, but also South Carolina's beach and golf. So I adopted the phrases and the terminology for tourism. As I got older into my forties and fifties, I realized that um, South Carolina was sitting on a gold mine when it came to African-American history and heritage that we were not leveraging. Charleston is a beautiful place yeah. because it, it properly leveraged its history and heritage. Um, South Carolina could do the same thing for all of African-American history and heritage, not just Gullah because South Carolina was pivotal in a lot of our history, including civil rights and reconstruction and Jim Crow. We were huge in those eras. Oh, yeah, no and, question. Yeah, and we were not leveraging that for tourism and travel. So I retired from the yeah. um, agency and I decided to put my foot into history and heritage, learn, because I don't know enough and I'm still learning, yeah. learn to see what it would take to incorporate the, the two, history and heritage, um, into tourism. And so that the benefits of tourism, which we is a twenty-eight billion dollar industry in South Carolina, some of those benefits also reach the uh, African Americans who have made this a rich and beautiful state it. to visit in the first place. White people take over this now. They they the one who enslaved us. They the one who mistreated us, and now they're also in some respects benefiting from what they did because of the tourism. Yes. We hear so often that they are on those plantations and they yes. have these tours. They don't tell it. They don't tell the story correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, they tell it from the side of the enslaver. They don't say how bad he was or she was and the things that they did. They just say, look at this grand home and all this other stuff. Yes. What, what, what's your take on that? If you, you know what I mean? In terms yes. of, they still getting the better of the deal, so to speak. Yeah. So, so the advantage is still with white people, but um, there is a shift in the interpretation of our plantations in South Carolina. And I don't know about plantations in other states, but in South Carolina, the um, the top five things they talk about are the African American experience and contributions at these plantations. There's a plantation in Charleston called McLeod Plantation. It does not talk about the white owners, the enslavers, and what they did. All it talks about is the African, the, the enslaved people, how they made the plantation wealthy, what they grew there, how they brought skills and 
and technology there to, 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 to build what they did to make this a commodity for, for the Lord's proprietors, how they, um, how they transitioned into emancipation, how the, the site became a um, Freedmen's Bureau, how they transitioned into uh, Jim Crow and reconstruction, then unfortunately Jim Crow and segregation through the early 20th century and what it is today. So that's McLeod Plantation. And then all the other major plantations also have uh, heightened African-American programming at their sites. So uh, Middleton Place and Magnolia on Ashley River Road. You've heard of Ashley River Road. Uh, um, yeah, I know Magnolia. Yeah, yeah uh-huh. The Both of them have um, significant African-American enslavement um, programming at their sites. And Drayton Hall has also stepped up. And they don't just have this programming that says, okay, this is what we think it was. This is what the documents tell us. This is what the historical record says. No, that's not the complete story. They talk to the descendants that they can find of the people who were enslaved in these places. And they, um, and they try to get them to uh, understand. They try to get people to understand exactly what life was like on the plantation what they contributed and all that stuff. So yes, so me, that's it's, changed it's, quite a bit. It's changed quite a bit, but the, the leverage is still in favor of, of of the white people who own the property. Okay. Could there be uh, a dynamic that happens where 10% uh, of the profits go to a black neighborhood, black descendants from these uh, plantations, these tour sites? Have you ever heard of that? Wow, that might be a great idea. I don't know what's going on right now. I don't know what's compensate. I don't know what's going on. I don't. I don't because these these some of these attractions charge thirty dollars to get into them. Oh man, God! So that could be that could be, that could be considered some reparations if we want to say so. Hmm. That, that's, that's a, a great idea. Yeah, that's a thought. Saying that we, we're saying that if you operate. And you got this plantation, you got this, that, and the other. Then we want to say ten percent of the profits go to such and such neighborhoods, such and such yeah. people, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, do is there an effort? How, how do the descendants of these people respond to this? Uh, the the plantations do they embrace them? Do they? I don't want to hear these stories no more. What, I you think know, there's a I think there's a mixed response. I think there is. I think um, I have to. I have to see. I know at Hampton Plantation, which is just up U.S. 17 from um, Charleston, the peninsula. They, before they make any significant changes on that plantation in terms of interpretation or in terms of, you know, building new things, they they consult with the descendants of the families that had been on the plantation. So I do know that. Um, that Boone, uh, that um, Hampton Plantation does that, but I don't know what they're doing at Middleton and Magnolia in that depth. I don't know what's going on yeah. with that. Is, is there is is there anybody or, or organization that represents the descendants and whatever their wishes might be? Um, there's not a statewide. You know what? I can let me look into this and get back to you because now you've raised a good point. Yeah, you know what I mean. We we all sitting over here and we don't. We don't know what's going on, or mm -hmm. and or how about this in your in your area? Are, are there uh, do the descendants come together in festivals? And I'm sure they do, but like name some of the festivals that they come together that they celebrate. They they you know keep the history alive, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think Germantown does that. Um, how about this? Happy nine. That's interesting. Let me let me see if I can yeah. find out for you. And I'll get back to you so you can tell your listeners. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about this? Is there a what's a good story that comes out of there? Out of your area that you've researched that, that made you proud? It made me proud? Yeah. Or made me cry, what'd you say? Both. You can do both. Oh. Okay. What's what a, made me what made me proud was that um you know the freedom song, We Shall Overcome, right? Yes. 
It was adopted into the civil rights movement after it was sung in Charleston, South Carolina at the cigar factory when the women who were working there went on a labor strike. They took an old gospel hymn, hymn and that said, I will overcome. And they changed it to, we shall overcome someday. And it was adopted into the civil rights movement um, shortly after that. And, but its roots are in Charleston at the cigar factory. Mm. And we have a, a historical marker up to that right outside the cigar factory. Now this huge brick building, historic brick building is now repurposed for lots of things, gift shops, boutiques, you know, cafes, restaurants. Sure. The only thing left there that, that talks about that history is the marker, the historic marker in front. So that to me was a proud moment, I thought. And there are so many. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah. What about a name? But, can, name can you name somebody that little pe that, that we, a lot of people don't know of? Well, uh, I don't know who your listeners are, but South Carolina knows Robert Smalls very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know, yeah. You do you do know him. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about uh let's see. There's a guy from Batesburg, Leesville, South Carolina, rural country off of Interstate 20. Uh, well, Interstate 20 wasn't together then. Yeah. He was a World War II vet, and he came home um, from uh, service, and he was um, pulled off a bus on his way home and beaten by local police. He was beaten so bad that they destroyed his eyes, and he went blind. Um, he was, he, it started because he had a disagreement on the bus and, um, and so we recently put a marker up to, in his honor in, uh, at the bus stop at, in Batesburg, Leesville in South Carolina in rural country. And it's called the blinding of Isaac Woodard. And to mm. me, that's a, that's a sad, that's yeah. a sad story. It made me want to cry. Yeah. Because here's this man serving his country yeah. and comes home to a country that doesn't take his word for anything and decides that he was a greater threat than the threats he fought overseas and blinded him in a beating. Wow. Another sad story that made me really cry was in Union County in our Foothills region in South Carolina, where a lot of people don't think there's a lot of African-American history in our up country, in our foothills region, because they're so used to Charleston, Beaufort, the low country, Columbia, Orangeburg. Um, no, but let me Union stop you there. When you say up country, low country, are you just talking about more further south or are you talking about is there a mountain or something like that that makes it up country? What, what makes it that way? Yeah, the, the tail end of the Blue Ridge is in South Carolina. Blue Ridge so Mountains. About, mm -hmm, so for about 85 miles, there's mountain country in South Carolina. Okay. And we have, and of course, mountains just don't stop. They have foothills along the way until we get to flatland. So okay. the Piedmont, who we call the foothills area, is where Union County is. Um, in Union County, I did not know until about three years ago that um, one of the state parks we have up there is called, um, it's called uh, Rose Hill Plantation State Historic Site. It is the site of a former governor of South Carolina. His sons were part of the Ku Klux Klan up there in South Carolina. And he, um, he um, they were very angry. They, they, they had lynchings all over. One was a pastor who would preach from his pulpit the importance of registering to vote and voting in all elections. And at the time, similar to some things today, they did not want black people voting. So the way to stop black people voting was to cut off the voice, cut off the people who were trying to help them vote. And the way to do that was to kill them. So they killed this pastor and they um, put his body on the side of a riverbank and um, would not let the family retrieve his body for a month, for an entire month, for an entire month, that man's body just sat there. And then they finally let the family retrieve him for an entire month. The same area, the same community um, also was very angry at a group of militia, federal militia. So once these fellas came back from World War I, 
they were militia in the low, in the upcountry in the Piedmont area, and they were arresting a bootlegger, a moonshine bootlegger. And in the melee of them arresting this moonshine bootlegger, um, the bootlegger was killed. So hundreds of white people from North Carolina and South Carolina decided that they didn't care that these people were doing their jobs and they were militia and they were hired by the federal government, that they were gonna make them pay for killing a criminal. So um, the sheriff of Union County instead put these black men in the jail, the Union County jail and said to the, to the masses, leave them alone. We're gonna leave them here until we have a trial. And well, of course, as soon as the sheriff turned his back, they broke into the jail, pulled out those 12 men and lynched them mm. for doing their jobs. And that was sad. But of course, we have some amazing um, triumph stories. We are the home of uh, um, Charles Bolden, who was a commissioner or secretary or director of NASA for a while, um, appointed by Barack Obama. We are the home of a guy named, oh, I can't remember his name, but he um, was part of the Manhattan Project that um, split the atom and created the atomic bomb, although that's kind of yeah. dark, but yeah, he's yeah. a brilliant man who went to an HBCU. He went to Benedict College. Uh, Benedict College at the time now is Benedict University. And um, yeah, so we have a lot of good, a lot of good stories. Yeah, sure. Our churches are resilient. Our AME churches, especially, that were built, they began as brush harbors, and they ended up um, being built in the mid 19th century, 1860s and on. They were um, community centers, and they are still beacons of hope and faith in our communities. And these congregations are more than 100 years old. And you can find a lot of them in the Green Book. In the Green Book. To okay, before we go in now, we're going to focus on the Green Book. Just, I guess just a couple more questions. Uh, do you get pushback for what you do? I don't. Um, I have I have created a profound partnership and collaboration with the tourism community because that's where I worked for 32 years. So they trust what I say to them. And um and they work with me. I sit on the board of the US Civil Rights Trail. Um I which is a tourism uh program. It's not the Civil Rights Network, which is the National Park Service History Program. It's a tourism program trying to get people to visit the southern, the southeastern states. Um, so people tend to trust what I'm saying. Now, there are older African Americans who I'm still learning from, but um, people tend to trust my input and they tend to embrace what I say. And if, and if I come across resistance, I tend to I tend to fight back for a little bit and then I step out because I have too much to do with people who are willing to work with me than, um, than fight naysayers. And because African-American history is so interesting to the consumer now, you know, we're a capitalistic nation. If the consumer's not interested, you go by the wayside. Right. If, you keep it, if you keep it interested to the consumer, then it stays top of mind. And that's why we have platforms for the consumer to use this African-American history. Okay, let, let me ask a question on that. Uh, uh, I, I know you might attest to this. I, I'm not speaking for you. A lot of that consumer uh, excitement is with white people. What, what's, your, what's your take on their excitement? Is their excitement from a different angle or maybe a couple angles? One is yeah. I'm really just interested Two is I'm sympathetic. Three is, and I wonder this when to some extent, hey, I like to hear what we did to y'all. <laughs> you, you follow what I'm okay. saying? So, so anecdotally, you know, the white race is filled with diversity as well. 
So you are going to have some white people who are just proud of their Confederate heritage. That's always going to be there. That's That's always going to be there. Yeah. But the advances we made in this country was 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 um, was diverse. White people helped us end slavery as well as us. White people helped us rise above Jim Crow throughout the civil rights. And white people are going to be as as well as us because we have to work hard at this as well are going to be the ones who help us um, rise above this CRT madness right now and all of this that's right this this craziness that's going on with um with bigotry in our yeah. in our nation and our politics right now yeah. so there is a huge segment of white people who sympathize with us i believe and this is anecdotally because i haven't even looked at any any polls or anything i believe there's a huge segment of white people who feel guilty I agree with who that. just absolutely feel guilty. The older white people who feel absolutely guilty. And I believe there's a segment of young white people who are like, why in the world are we even talking about race? Why did our parents do this? Let's get together. Let's just love each other. What's going on? Right. I believe there's something like that too. So uh, I, I don't know the answer. I yeah. just know anecdotally what I what I see and what I believe. But but you know at the same token when we say that man, we we dealing with the present scenarios of the uh, past administration I'm talking about presidency number forty five we got to go without name I think that that has heightened some yeah. disdain for black people would you say that's the scenario It feels like it when I look at uh, legislation that happens in the states especially the southern states where I am yeah and um. When I see, you know, uh, excuses that people make for police killings of our young people, our unarmed young people, I think when I see um, resistance to Black advancement, like the Supreme Court justice we just got, um, when I see resistance to Barack Obama um, or, or Michelle Obama or Eric Holder, I do believe that, uh, um, There has been some issue with the past administration um, that made people feel good about their fears. And it is wrong. And I think the tide is turning against them right now. I think the tide, I think the tide can't turn fast enough. I think I wish it would go faster. I wish it would just, you know, everything would be great, but the tide is turning, I think. When when uh, coming down on this note, uh, what's a good day for you? When a good you know, day? In, in, in terms of what you do, define it, a good it, day. Yeah, what's a good a day? good A good day for me is um, when I have a major funder call and say, "Hey, we're going to give you enough money that you can live off of this in, the interest from this endowment, and um, you can continue to." Uh, do all the work you need to do to get African-American history preserved, protected, and told in South Carolina. And I have not had that yet. I have not had a major funder or a group of funders say, the Wigoja Foundation deserves this million dollar endowment. You live off of 10,000 a year and get your work done. Um, I have not had that. And And I would love to have that. I have phenomenal volunteers. I have phenomenal help from a lot of people. We get some grants, but um, we don't have enough to to operate at the level I want to operate. So a good day to me would be that. Another good day to me would be that we discover that some of our local organizations also have the funding, the um, knowledge, and the training they need to survive as nonprofit organizations. Gotcha. Because I believe I, mm-hmm, I believe that a lot of our uh, the passion in South Carolina for preserving African American history and heritage is not little. It's a lot. It's a lot of passion. What's lacking is the funding and the leveraging we need. Because you know we don't have it like other people do. So we have to create it. We have to build it. We have to manifest it. And the only way to do that is is by networking and talking yes. to people like you. What 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 what's uh what 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 information would you like to learn from a historical perspective that you might be doing some research on about this person or this happened that kind of thing? Is there anything like that 
Yeah. So I want to know, I'm still learning the process of how uh, South Carolinians valued education from the days of slavery all the way through Brown versus Board, all the way through civil rights, and even today through our HBCUs and all of that. And why it's important to make the to connect those dots because our resilience is not just an era. Our resilience is ongoing always. And we're still it. fighting that with the CRT. It. We're still fighting it with CRT. So education leadership in South Carolina has been going on for centuries. And I wanna make sure I tell that story in its totality in that, in that realm so that people understand better understand the contributions we made to education in this nation, not just in South Carolina, but in this nation. You know, Briggs versus Elliott happened in South Carolina and it was one of five cases that built Brown versus Board. Oh, okay. um, Robert Smalls was the one who stole that Confederate ship That's and right. sailed into, he became a, a US Congressman and he wrote legislation for public schools. That's right. So, you know, so education in South Carolina, Penn, Penn School, Penn School, Penn Center was yep. the first school in the Southeast for the formerly enslaved. That's right. So education has always been a huge value in our nation, in our state. And I want to connect those dots so that people can value it better, have public policy that supports it better and, you know, stops creating these fake fears about learning about our history. That's, come on, what is at, that? At, 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 we're coming to a close almost. Has a white person come up to say, I like what you do? Yes, every white person who's come up to me has said, I like what you do. Everybody on my board, I have three white people on my board. Of course, they're, they're passionate about supporting me. My former uh, co-workers are, are proud and passionate about what I'm doing. Um, most of the tourism industry is proud of what I'm doing. Um, so I don't have, I think if there were naysayers, they'd be afraid to talk to me. I think they'd be afraid. Yeah. And they wouldn't you, come you, in my face. They might talk about me behind my back. Yeah, right, saying. right. That you, you, you mentioned that, that uh, the book and, and, and uh, show us the book again. This is a book that you all have produced and published and that kind of thing. Yes, okay, so there's a book company in, in our Piedmont called Hub City Press. And they came to us and said, hey, we want to take your stuff off of online and put it into a guide that people can, can look at and see and want to go visit these places. And I said, absolutely. Oh, heck go yeah. Oh. So they got a photographer from the International African American Museum and okay. went around the state and took these photos and got and put our, our guide together. You can find it on Amazon. Okay. Uh, you can probably find it. I don't know in your market or in other people's markets. You can find it at Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, but the probably the best place to buy it is Amazon. It's, so it's Amazon, yeah. The Green Book of South Carolina. You have to put of South Carolina in it. Okay. We're gonna put all that in the description. Now, is is your organization do you want to uh eventually have a museum? Is that part of your aim per we se? We want to we, so we want to support the International African American Museum, but we do think that the state needs a civil rights museum, a solid civil rights museum that talks about nothing but civil rights. So that, because South Carolina was pivotal in civil rights. And to me, the place to have that is in Orangeburg, the city of Orangeburg. Oh, That's really? where our flagship HBCUs are, SC State and Claflin. And there's a, a downtown street that, that's right in front of SC State and Claflin. And that's where these students went when they protested segregation. And they, um, the, the, the bowling alley where they protested at and the drug counters they protested at are on Russell, Russell Street. The jail where they were housed when they were arrested, that's on Russell Street. And the courthouse where they were, where their cases were adjudicated, that's on Russell Street. So to me, Russell Street in Orangeburg County needs to be a civil rights walking district. Okay. And it needs to be preserved and protected as a museum. Okay. Um, that's greater than me. 
um, that's greater than we go to foundation, but but we go to will support and collaborate with anybody who wants to do that with us. I love it. You you mentioned earlier uh, about the International Museum in Charleston. Tell us just a tad of that because uh, I know oh. they're opening soon. Yes, January 2023, the International African American Museum is going to open, and of course, oh, the story here is stunning to me. They um. They, 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 it's built on Gadsden's Wharf. I don't know if you heard of Gadsden's Wharf in South Carolina. It was the number one disembarkation point for enslaved Africans coming from the motherland, from the west coast of Africa. Wow. So if they survived the Middle Passage, most of them at this period in time landed right here at Gadsden's Wharf in South Carolina, um, if they survived. And so the International African American Museum is, is built on that. A piece of it goes over the water to pay homage to the, um, the people who perished in the water on that long journey. But of course it covers not just African American history limited to what the colonies did to us. It covers African history as well. It talks about that as well because it's important that people realize that our history did not begin when we landed here. Our history was much older than that. So some of that's there, but then it carries us through all of the eras of history in, and into present day. So it does talk about um, slavery during the colonies, slavery during, you know, after uh, the Revolutionary War, our role in the Revolutionary War, um, rebellions that we had, uh, emancipation, um, the fights that we had to fight emancipation, Robert Smalls, um, how we survived Jim Crow and segregation, uh, well, reconstruction before that, Jim Crow and segregation, right. how we did, um, launched civil rights, which was decades. It wasn't just the 50s and 60s. It was all the way in the 1920s when right. we started doing that um, until today. And it also talks about our um, our successes, Robert McNair, who was the astronaut who piloted the Challenger, That's unfortunately, right. and passed away. Right. Um, right. Charles Bolden, of course, who was a NASA director. Um, and Congressman Clyburn, Congressman Jim Clyburn, who is um, a whip, who is our whip right now, majority whip, That's who right. has significant influence in federal policy. So um, we, you know, so the museum is, fascinating. I expect it to have the same fanfare and celebration as the Smithsonian did in the nation, except it won't be national. It'll be more Southeastern. Yeah, and, I'm going to um, be there. I'm, 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 you know, I am I'm, I'm, got it on my radar. Well, I uh, hope to meet you in person yeah, then. I yeah, I, well, I'm going to be at the Penn Center in November. Oh, oh really? For Heritage yeah, Day? Yeah, yeah, I'm coming down. Oh, yeah. Con oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Very yeah. good. I I've been there once before. Mm -hmm. let, let, me, let me ask you this. Uh, um, how did you come up with the name for your organization? Ooh. Okay. So if you go to wegoja.org. How do you spell that too? Uh, W-E. It's in my, it's in my, oh, you can't yeah. see that? Yeah. W-E, G as in goat, O-J-A, wegoja.org. And if you get on the about section, uh, the about pages, um, it explains how we came up with our name. In the middle of the page, it says, read more. And what it is, is that we took um, ancestral language from West Coast Africa, from the communities that were Wolof and um, Yoruba. And we, we go to, is an acronym from some of those principal words. So the we, and we go just is Gullah, and it means our, because of course Wolof and Yoruba were the uh, were the enslaved that created the Gullah language just after uh, they were emancipated. The G and we go just stands for Jim Sabop, which is believe in yourself, believe in yourself. The O is Ojo, you want to, and it means future. The J is Wolof. And it means purpose. It's the, and you pronounce it um, Jom. And the A is Yoruba. It's pronounced Asa, and it means culture. So we put all that together: culture, purpose, courage, 
um, future, believe in yourself, all of us, and came up with WeGoja. Love it. Oh, uh, you proud of yourself, aren't you? This has become your mission, hasn't it? It is my mission now. It's a labor of love. I believe that all generations, our future generations especially, um, don't need to just learn. We need to make it easy for them to learn about this. It's important for them to feel pride and feel joy and feel a sense of place and purpose with who and what they are instead of allowing uh, these manufactured things tell them, like it told me when I was a kid, I wanted Jordache jeans with uh, limestone, with rhinestones on them as well. I remember those. <laughs> yep. But, um, but uh, instead of letting that artificial stuff influence who they are, and I don't want to beat them over the head with this information, but it's going to be here for them. Easy to find, easy to ingest, easy to understand when they're ready. And that is my goal. I love it. Thank you so very much for coming on. Oh, hold on, you say that. Is there a question that I have not asked you that comes to mind? You always, you know, people say, I meant to say this. I didn't know this. Anything like that per se? Oh, oh, oh. I do want to say a couple of things. Um, yes. We have a podcast oh, uh, called uh, South Carolina Legacy of Courage. It talks about South Carolina's role in the civil rights movement. Stunning. I got some of the best history and luminaries in South Carolina to talk about this, including Cecil Williams, Congressman Clyburn, Michael Allen. I mean, it's just some really good people. And it's three three episodes. They're about an hour, 50, 50 minutes, hour long each. Mm. And it's you can find it on any place you get your podcast. Search for SC Legacy of Courage. Okay. Of course, the Green Book is available online at yeah. Green Book of S c.com and of course my hard copy yes. um we're about to enter into a rosenwald project that the national park service is putting together to do a trail of rosenwald schools and you're familiar with rosenwald yep, schools. yep yep i'm familiar um, so we're tell somebody that. else right quick right quick oh tell tell your your listeners yeah yeah, yeah. what yeah okay, what rosenwald okay. okay so julius rosenwald was president of sears and roebuck and he hooked up with Booker T. Washington, Alabama, and said, you know what, in these rural communities, these African-American children need to, need to get some formal education because it, it was out of reach for them. So he would put down half, like 50% or maybe 25%, 50% of the cost of building a school building in some of these rural communities. He started out with just wanting to build 100. He ended up building 5,000 all around the Southeast. South Carolina had 500 ourselves. So National Park Service said, okay, we're going to do a Rosenwald Trail from Chicago where he's based at, where he was based at. And we're gonna fan out to the Southeast and give and show people examples of what these Rosenwald schools were. One room, two room, seven room, teachers, teacherages, and some were brick buildings. Mm. The thing about Rosenwald is that in the late 1940s and early 1950s, the kids who went to Rosenwald were finally eligible to go to college. They went to college and these were the college students involved in the civil rights movement. There you go. So Rosenwald, and that's why I said, I wanna connect the dots right. to education. So because education has had such a profound advancement for African-Americans throughout history. I love it. Uh, everybody, this is what we do is strong is great. I told you it's going like this lady. This has become her passion. I know everybody's down there. They're proud of her. And she don't take no. No. Don't take no. This is what she's doing. So on and so forth. And she came up with the name uh, that once you get it, you got it. <laughs> you can pronounce it, but it's, it it has all that symbolism in there. Yes, yes. And I, I didn't come up with it personally. Yeah. Um, a group of people did. I just assumed executive director of, of the yep, organization. There it is. They've been doing this. So um, uh, everybody hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the like button on this video, hit the notifications bell. Tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself. Uh, right. Watch my movie, get my uh, get my book, and get her book, the green book. There it is. Um, and uh, to you, I say this with all sincerity, and I mean this. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I love what you're doing. I Thank love you. that you was exposed to the things you were and it moved you like you did. It did. You had you had a career path that didn't include this initially. 
At but all. it did include this. It prepared you for where you are. Yes, it did. It did. It, it prepared you. And you you just you using them skills that you got out of that and said, let me use it uh, in particular for our, our people. That's right. That's a beautiful thing. For our people, correct. For our people. That's and right. other people, they get something out of it, but it is our people that they get yes. what they get. <clears throat> when we build tourism in South Carolina, everybody benefits, not just African Americans, but I want to make it to the I want to make it a point that African Americans are no longer excluded from any of it. So uh -huh. that's why I'm doing this. Whew, there it is, everybody. Boom shaka locker. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Tell everybody I, I said hi down there. I'll see you soon. To the good looking guy that walks behind you. I know he's hearing what you're saying. He probably yeah. here too. That's uh, my tell husband. him I yeah. said hi. I'm uh, uh, uh we're gonna keep it moving. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Bye-bye. We out.